Hey, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems. Very biased collection. It was usual, of course. Um, today I would like to tell, tell you about a theorem which is a bit disappointing in some sense. Um, so I'm going to talk about a the disappointing theorem. Well, it is also pretty cool because I'm going to explain one of my favorite geometric objects, uh, coxeter complexes. So really kind of a general setting and really beautiful geometry going on. But then if you zoom into the topology, it kind of gets a bit boring, as we will see. So kind of the, the statement is a bit disappointing because you have a rich set of spaces with really rich geometry, with really rich combinatorics. But if you kind of choose the wrong notion of equivalence, in this case, wrong will be um, using topo topo topological notions, you will get kind of very disappointing results in some sense. You might disagree with my statement that everything here is disappointing that I'm going to say. In some sense, it's also exciting, obviously. Um, but I want to kind of point out the kind of difference of how you see various objects and what kind of settings, whether it's geometric, combinatorics, algebra, topology, whatever, will usually change the answer a lot. And here we have a beautiful example of this. Um, yeah, so let's get started. And then we'll see a disappointing theorem. So today, as I said, disappointing uh, theorems. A very big disappointment in the end. So I will be, I will be crying. I can already tell. Um, so let's start with the symmetric groups. I call them coxeter complexes. And no, no, I got one. Everyone calls these beasts that I'm going to construct coxeter complexes. Um, so they're usually associated to coxeter groups. But let's let's postpone that until the very end. If you don't know what a coxeter group is, the only thing you need to know is what a symmetric group is. So the automorphisms of a finite set. Uh, in my example here, my finite set is very finite. It's just one, two, three. And that's S3, the automorphisms of one, two, three. And I usually like to think of these as permutations into forms of strings. So all right, I write down the sequence one, two, three. And here, one goes to two. Well, this is spot two, draw, draw a string here. Two goes to three. So this is spot three. And uh, three goes to one. So here I have the permutation where one goes to three. Sorry, this was the wrong combination. Anyway, it depends a bit how you read it. So one goes to two, two goes to three, and three goes to one. So I'm usually like to read along the little string diagram. So these guys are called string diagrams. They're just absolutely cute. I hope that's reasonably clear. So I could write a, uh, whatever kind of number at the bottom and I draw some stringy diagram that permutes them and I can read off the corresponding permutation, the corresponding object of my symmetric group. And in this code, I can think of it as acting on a nice space. So every symmetric group will act on a nice space. In general, it will be a simplex, but in this little example, it's just a triangle. And what I do is I kind of color my vertices or I number my vertices by the corresponding numbers. And then the permutation is just a permutation. So this guy sends green to, to, to red. So my little green one here goes where the red one was before and whatever it sends. Uh, red to blue, so the red one goes to where the blue one was before, and then the blue one goes to what is a good color now? Maybe I use red. The blue one goes to where the green one was before, and you get the other picture. And here's a little bit of more example. So this is symmetry of the triangle, and in order to illustrate it, I break the symmetry by coloring the uh, corresponding vertices or corners of uh, this beast. And you'll see this, this beautiful pattern here, just the, the symmetry group acts by permutation of the vertices and it keeps trying on what it is. In general, kind of the symmetric group acts on a higher dimensional space called simplex. Uh, so the tetrahedron for the ones who like three-dimensional geometry and the higher ones are just called higher simplices. And they're a bit difficult to imagine, obviously. Some are they easy to imagine, because it's kind of a generalization of the triangle and the tetrahedron. Uh, but of course, at least my brain fails a bit for using an explicit kind of picture in my head for a 15 dimensional space. Um, I'm just very, very much a failure uh, of nature. I can't even imagine a 15 dimensional space except abstractly. Anyway, um, so what we will do is we will consider this group as given by, generated by the reflections. So here's a reflection uh, if you swap two and three, which is one of the generating reflection, as you can see, this one is fixed. So we are essentially just reflecting in this line here, right? Reflecting those. And so those are the generating reflections. And if you like those pictures, my two generating reflections here, there's those two. So I just take I and I plus one. 
And we'll see what kind of geometry comes out of this picture. Okay, so here's the geometry I want to do. I have my triangle in the background, but I kind of want to forget about the triangle and I want to look at a different space. Obviously my question, what is it your matter object corresponding to a symmetric group could have been answered by the triangle or the simplices, but that's not quite the answer I would like you to give. Otherwise the video would already be over. Um, anyway, but I have my triangle in the background and I draw my hyperplanes of reflection here and I have them for S and T uh, where S, uh, the red one, is just this one and T, the blue one, is just this one. And I can just draw the hyperplanes um, corresponding to those reflections and the hyperplanes are orthogonal to the reflections themselves. So here's the blue reflection. Um, no, this is a red reflection. Let me try again. So this is a red reflection. And the corresponding hyperplane is orthogonal to that reflection. And here's the blue reflection. Here it is. It acts here as the hyperplane is orthogonal to the corresponding blue reflection. Cool. And then they have a different another hyperplane um, given by the opposite of those. That we call this a green reflection. It goes like here. But anyway, um, so the, I only have two generating hyperplanes. The other one is obtained by composition. But anyway, this kind of cuts the space. So the hyperplanes are now the ones orthogonal to them. So um, I, let me take out my drawings again. So the hyperplanes are now here, the red one orthogonal to the reflection, uh, the blue one orthogonal to the reflection, and the composite, the green one, orthogonal to its reflection. And it cuts the space, as you can see now, nicely into what is called an alcove, which are kind of the connected components if you take out what I just marked in colors. So you take out this uh, six valent thingy, it's sitting in the background, you take it out, and whatever remains the connected components are called alcoves. And now you can think of the symmetric group as acting on those pictures, which is kind of very strange. It's kind of orthogonal to the triangle, but it's now acting on all of space. And the action is just given by reflection along the hyperplane. So here's my hyperplane, and I can reflect this guy to here, and I call it SC, or I can reflect this guy along the uh, well, blue hyperplane, and I come here. And I reflect this one along the blue hyperplane, I go to here, and let me just follow it, and then I can reflect along the red hyperplane again, I go here, and I can reflect along the blue hyperplane, and I go here. So I really just go around, and now I permute those connected components, which I call alcoves. So the symmetric group is another geometric object. The symmetric group uh, acts on this hyperplane complement by reflection along the hyperplane. So original ones we took, take the orthogonal one, now we have the reflection along those. And that's essentially already the Coxeter complex. Uh, we will just use it to, to create a finite object instead of now this infinite object, which is all of space. But that's essentially um, what it is. And the point is, this guy acts really faithfully here. So I can identify, let's, let's just pick some starting point and I call it one. And then I can identify all elements by just following um, the action of the hyperplane. So here's S, you can identify this with S. This is S T, this is T by just reflecting. Uh, this is T S. And the last one is uh, S S S equals well, not quite, S, T, S equals C, S, T. And you can just write that down in terms of permutations. Huh? So the last relation in terms of my little string diagrams is this one here. So S, this is S, this is T, the other one is T. So S, T, S, and then the other relation is equal to T, S, T. Now it's kind of the so-called randomized move or break move. Anyway, so we have a faithful action on a different object than the triangle. It's now all of space. Of course, it was cooked up from the triangle, but it's come out of a different perspective. We are now acting in all of space. And we're acting in a way that we can uh, detect the whole group again. That's already fantastic. Uh, that's really fantastic. So we just take these hyperplanes orthogonal to the original reflections and reflect in those, and we get a kind of a partition of all of space um, into those little things that we can add kind of then identify with the group itself. So the group can be identified with all of space if you want, except for the hyperplanes that you need to take out. Because on the hyperplanes, of course, the point on the hyperplane is fixed under a reflection along it. And we essentially that you just take the shadow in the in the background. Um, so whatever you see here, just now mark points on the uh, 
uh, reflecting hyperplanes. And uh, what we will get here is exactly, we just mark the chambers, the alcoves, and we mark one of them as identity, we follow them along, we have now marked everything, so we can now uh, construct this complex, which is really just get, putting some points here, here's a point, here's a point, here's a point, here's a point, and so on, and you just connect them and call the edges whatever the, whatever the alcove is called, whatever the chamber is called. Okay? And then you get this thingy um, with a slight difference that I stole those pictures. So here the identity is at the bottom, which corresponds to marking the bottom alcove. So it's rotating your head a little bit. And then you get from uh, this picture to this picture. Let me just do this one live. Uh, so here CST. So if I would have started if I wouldn't be super lazy and just steal pictures from various absolutely fantastic sources linked in the description. Then I would have ended up with an identity here. I would have put an S here. I would have put a T here. And now I'm not to, do, to get confused. This is TS, this is ST. So I would have put a TS here. I would have put an ST here. Ooh, what a coincidence, one of them uh, the sects. And I would have put this one here. I hope that makes some sense. I just have a turn rotated picture because lazy, okay? That's, that's the only reason why I have a rotated picture. Otherwise, I just, every alcove has now an element of the group marked by it, and I just essentially draw those lines instead of the alcoves. And that object is called the Cochrane complex. It's now a finite geometric object. So we turn a triangle into a hexagon, which is kind of fun. <laughs> but anyway, so here I have a hexagon. And you can do the same for all higher, um, for all higher rank symmetric groups, and you get some geometric object. And you wonder what kind of geometric object do I get? So the combinatorx is really rich because as I said, this is a faithful action of the somatic group, meaning the somatic group is reflected in that object. Um, so the combinatorx and geometry is really rich, but the topology, disappointment, disappointment, remember, is kind of very boring. It's like really, really boring because it's always homeomorphic to a sphere. And if I haven't messed up, it should be somatic group minus two sphere. Okay, so for example, our friend, the two sphere, which is really just the soccer ball, is the Coxeter complex of S4, where we now have, uh, well, here we had two reflection operations, and in S4, we have now three reflection operations. So here's one, uh, here's one. These are really bad drawings, but anyway, and here's one. And if you do that, and follow the same complex, and now you're um, partitioning three space into those alcoves, so like alcoves, and connect them all together. What you get is topologically a sphere, a two sphere. And um, the one from the previous slide is just, well, an edgy thingy. It's just a straight sphere. So this is homeomorphic to a circle, right? So uh, if I haven't messed up, uh, S3 should be homeomorphic to S1. S4, the, the box star complex for S4 is Sn1 minus 2. It's a little bit of a disappointing statement because as you can see here, you have all these alcoves, all these marked things and all this rich geometry and you can label now the the, the, uh, the patches of the soccer ball, of this funny soccer ball, you can label them uh, with elements of symmetric groups. So there are 24 of them. It's absolutely fantastic geometry. It's absolutely great. But topologically, they're not that exciting, right? They're homeomorphic uh, to a sphere, which is kind of an exciting statement because, well, there you go, it always closes up. That's what I'm saying. Um, and into a nice object, into the easiest topological object, not, not for example, into a torus, it just closes up into a sphere, which is remarkable. So if you want to think of this as a not disappointing statement, but as a remarkable statement, fair enough, you can. I do agree. So I find it disappointing and remarkable at the same time, but I'm just weird anyway. So um, that's perfectly fine. And yes, this works in general. So it's called not symmetric group complex, but it's called the Cox the complex um, because it's named after Cox theta, I guess, but also because it works for Cox the groups. Uh, for general Cox the groups, you can associate uh, those, those spaces. And uh, here's some examples. Uh, turns out that there's a really, really nice uh, theorem again, or a disappointing one. So either your Coxter group is finite, like the symmetric group, and then you get the sphere always, right? Even if you take something more fancy, like uh, you start with the symmetry group of an isocahedron, which is a Coxter group, you get a very interesting looking soccer ball, but you can still get a soccer ball. Or 
it's infinite. And in that case, so here's an example of an infinite one, you get uh, a paving of space, and that's a contractible space. Um, uh, so it's not homeomorphic to a point, so that's a bit too strong, but it's homotopic to a point. So it's kind of the next in this statement. So topology here is very boring. It's either a sphere or trivial, if you want, um, but geometry is fabulous and rich, so you can label here your elements of your Coxeter group, now label all of space, which is uh, kind of a really interesting thing. In a non-trivial way, you can read off a lot of combinatorics and representation theory and whatever, just from those uh, nice pictures. Anyway, uh, you can decide now whether you think the theorem is trivial, no, certainly not trivial. If you think it's trivial, I'm, I have nothing to say. I don't think it's trivial at all. If it's disappointing, or exciting, or maybe even both, or maybe neither, whatever. So you feel, feel free to decide for yourself. Obviously, you should always decide for yourself. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I also hope to see you next time.